Hi, I'm Laura. Moving. And today's chat is on luxury in the time of COVID with um, Parisian-based band, brand Boucheron. And we have the CEO of Boucheron, uh, Hélène pouvy Duquen, um, chatting with us today from Paris, a little bit about Hélène. Um, she uh, pursues the growth of the Maison on an international scale and focuses on strengthening its position among the most prestigious jewelers in the world. She started her career at LVMH and has also worked at Cartier uh, before joining Boucheron, a part of the Caring Group. Hello, Hélène. How are you today? Very fine, and you? Good. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm happy, super happy to have a chat with you. Wonderful. Well, we have so many questions for you about your brand. Um, starting with what, in your words, uh, what can you tell us about how, what makes the Maison unique? Alors, I think the first thing is that what makes uh, the positioning of Boucheron so specific um, is because of our creativity uh, and very strong innovation uh, on the product side, meaning that it's been part of uh, the history of the brand to be super innovative. Our founder, Frédéric Boucheron, uh, used to be himself super innovative. He won many prizes at the Universal Exhibitions, and he was both super creative and super innovative on the, um, I would say, a design side and also on the technical side. So um, I think this is really the first important thing that you have to understand um, uh, to understand what is Boucheron compared to other brands uh, on the market. The second thing um, is probably that we are the most um, human and woman-centric brand on Place Vendôme. Uh, because Frédéric Boucheron, also because of the history of the brand, Frédéric Boucheron, at the beginning, used to curate some pieces. He was selecting pieces. He was not manufacturing at the beginning when he, was, he had a shop on Palais Royal. And so from the beginning, he decided to put the woman at the center and to select pieces for his best clients. And then suddenly he became super famous because of his taste, because he was selecting some extravagant pieces for his client. And then he decided to have a real brand and, and to have also ateliers. Um, with craftsmen to, re, to really design and probably manufacture the pieces he wanted. But at the beginning, he, uh, from the beginning, really uh, put the woman at the center. And that is why it comes to the third point, which is really differentiating at Boucheron, is that in the creative process and in all the way we're doing things, we are very free at Boucheron because um, we consider that as women is at the center of what we're doing, uh, we want to give them freedom, freedom to be, freedom to wear. It means that when a woman comes to Boucheron, it's really to select pieces that will express who they are, their personality, um, and not only um, status, not only power, not only, it's really about the emotional value uh, of, of what, what has a piece, um, and what can express from you. So there's something about styling also, which is very strong uh, at Boucheron compared to more traditional high jewelry brands, because style is part of our DNA. Uh, Frédéric Boucheron used to be the son of drapers. And so he always lived when he was a child um, into fabrics, uh, into um, uh, the, the most elegant pieces of that time. And I think that the couture part of our uh, brand is still very strong. So it comes to how women behave um, and, and how they want to style themselves. And it means that at Boucheron, Jerry uh, becomes part of the styling. It's not, not only about clothes, it's also about the piece of Jerry that you wear that becomes part of, of your style. Last but not least, um, Frédéric Boucheron used to be a man super um, emotional, empathic, and humanist. So he was very close to his employee. Um, he had many projects uh, to support uh, the old people on the industry, but also to support the kids. Um, he even funded uh, the French uh, high jury school, which is, it still exists, Rue du Louvre in Paris. So um, I would say that uh, there's something very strong in the DNA uh, at a more, I would say, corporate level, um, which is empathy, sympathy, closeness to our clients. Um, and it's something very, very strong. 
emotion, emotion is really a part of the story that we tell today. And what are the Bashan icons? Alors, in terms of icon, um, the first icon of the brand is Kat Ring, that you may know. Enfin, Kat is not only a ring, but mainly a ring. It has been designed as a ring. And um, it represents our best-selling model today. And as you may know, all the cherry brands need to have an icon. And for us, it's really Kat. Kat has been created in 2004. And I think the reason why it's our best-selling model, it's because it embodies all um, the creative spirit of the brand. It's a very bold um, uh, ring, but also uh, it, have, it has all the different cuts of the maison. Uh, you have a line which represents les pavés de la place Vendôme, so Vendôme place. You have a line that represents gros grain, which is a fabric that used to be uh, very common um, in, in the couture industry and it's still uh, common. So, and the ring of, uh, and also a line of diamonds and um, it's and the double godron. So you have four cuts for quatre. And it's really all the different cuts of the maison and that is why it is uh, our uh, icon today. But we have other uh, super important lines in terms of jewelry. The second one is Serpent Bohème. It's been created in the 60s. Um, and I would say it's a figurative uh, representation of the snake. Uh, it's typical of the late 60s and the beginning of the 70s. Um, and we have a large offer on Serpent Bohème, which is doing very well in some parts of the world. It's really the second icon. And lately, we launched uh, 18 months ago, uh, Jack de Boucheron, which is our, we hope so, our new icon to be, um, which is a UFO in the jewelry industry because uh, when I give a brief to uh, Claire Schwann, our artistic director, I said to her, you don't have the right to do a ring. You have to do something else. And um, in fact, Jack is not a ring. Jack is not a bracelet. Jack is not... Um, a necklace, Jack, is all that you want it to be. You can wear it uh, on your wrist, you can wear it on your, on your, on your neck, uh, you can wear it in your hair, you can put it as an accessory for a bag, you can do whatever you want, you can have a one row, three row, six rows, you can plug them, and you create your own jewelry. So I think it's going to be, and I hope it's going to be a super important also icon at Boucheron, really embodying the free spirit of Boucheron. And this is for the jewelry part, but in terms of icons, we have also a separate business, which is, as you may know, hydry. And in terms of hydry, uh, we really have one icon, which is the question man necklace that uh, uh, has been created by Frédéric Boucheron himself in 1879, and that we still have in our collection today. Uh, we're, presented, uh, we're presenting some hydry um, question mark necklace pretty much all year long depending on the collection, but we're re-editing a lot. And for the clients, the VIP that are buying hydrary, I think they are really coming to Boucheron um, to buy that icon of hydrary. How would you say that the brand has innovated throughout the years? Um, I think that for us, innovation is so part of our DNA that um, it is a kind of duty. We have the chance today that it is a kind of duty. Because um, if you look at the archives and the history of the brand, uh, as I was explaining, Frédéric Boucheron was super innovative and it's a kind of tradition. And um, that is why to respect the past, we have to push the boundaries of hydrate today. And when I joined Boucheron, it's exactly what I said to Claire. I want us to push again the boundaries of hydrate. I want us to bring to the industry something with, which is new. Um, not, not for the sake of innovation. It's not innovation for the sake of innovation. It's innovation because of the respect of the past, but also it's innovation for beauty and, and um, for poetry. So it's not only a, on a technical standpoint that we want to do that. It's really because we want uh, the world to be um, the most beautiful possible. So it's really part of, of our history. And you just launched a new high jewelry collection, which is Contemplation, correct? Yes, exactly. Please tell us about it. <laughs> Alors, Contemplation um, is a collection that is very dear to Claire's heart and to mine too. Um, contemplation, the funny thing is that uh, Contemplation is about, I would say, um, 
the sky and taking the time to contemplate what is outside. And um, in fact, we decided of, of using that theme for the Hajiri collection in, um, I think, three years ago. And uh, then I had discussions with Claire because she wanted to launch it in 2019. But as we were reopening um, the flagship boutique in Place Vendôme, and uh, she also had a theme which was about architecture and Paris. I said I want the collection about uh, architecture and Paris to, to be launched in 2019 when we reopened that building. So I postponed the collection of contemplation, uh, which finally came just after uh, COVID lockdown. And so it's quite surprising that it comes at that time because it's telling something that is echoing to what we've been living recently. And that is why I think it's even more poetry uh, in, in, in the, the, the time that, that we are living. The collection is totally amazing, um, super pure, um, super elegant, and extremely innovative because we have three pieces, the three major pieces of the collection that I, I really love particularly. Um, the most incredible one is um, a cloud full of of diamonds, you have more than 250 carats of diamond, and you read like, like having a cloud of diamond around your neck. And um, for that piece, I think it's the most surprising of the collection, and to me, the most interesting, because you may know that high jury uh, is part of um, the art decorative, decorative art, that is why you have exhibition in museums about high jury. But when it comes to that kind of piece, it's really close to contemporary art. And I would say that Claire is inventing a new style, which is at the, at the link, it's a link between um, contemporary art uh, brought to traditional art uh, that, that we have in, in high tree. So I think it's super important, and I hope then in uh, some decades, in fact, this kind of piece um, will be displayed in museum. I'm sure it will. Uh, happen at, at some time. So this, this is my, my most favorite uh, piece in the collection because it's super extravagant and it, it's been um, two years of research and development to really uh, um, manufacture that piece. So um, I love that one. So you've got this amazing new collection, but how hard was it to launch this during the time of COVID? And I think um, we had luck uh, again, sometimes uh, you need luck in life. And I think we had luck because uh, last year, um, the pieces have been manufactured quite lately. And I was a little bit upset because uh, they really came just few hours before uh, the launching. So I said to the team for next year, um, I really want that you take three months in advance in your, in your retro planning, meaning that I want all the pieces to be uh, released in February or March. And uh, then COVID came, we had the lockdown in France, so we had to close the atelier. Uh, and then suddenly um, we delayed the collection by three months, but then we were still in time, meaning that we had the, the pieces just before beginning of July as last year, which is a little bit tight, but that um, happened to be the right timing. And that is why during Couture Week, uh, we had the chance to, um, to present 80% of the pieces of the collection, which is a collection of 67 pieces. We had the majority of them and we had the most uh, important um, necklace, the most important pieces of that collection. So I think it, we had that luck. The second thing is that just before um, being locked down um, with Claire and the, the marketing director at Boucheron, we went um, to Tucson in Arizona where there's a super big show about stone, one of, one of the most exquisite, I think, in the world. So um, we went there for one week buying many stones. Um, and so we didn't have the stress of, of the lockdown because we knew that we had the relevant stock in terms of stone to manufacture and finish all the pieces. Um, so fortunately, we were well organized um, to, um, to have all the pieces at the right time. Well, now, how are you going to show the pieces to people that can't get to Paris? Maybe things like Zoom? Uh, yes, exactly. Uh, it has been very difficult for two reasons, because at uh, during Couture Week, uh, beginning of July, we have the chance to have both the VIC clients, 
um, and also all the press from all over the world. So when uh, the lockdown began, we were super um, stressed about how we are going to, uh, um, to present if, um, if the clients and, and the press, international press cannot come to us in Paris. And as always, uh, when you have a crisis, you have to be very agile and very uh, intelligent on, on, on inventing new things. And in a few hours, we decided to have a totally new approach um, based on mixing physical and digital. Uh, and so, for example, in Couture Week, all the journalists that were in Paris had the chance to see the collection in real. And uh, we had sessions with four to five journalists per session. It was super intimate with Claire and myself, and we showed the collection and we explained everything. But then for the rest of the journalists, we had to invent a new concept. And in fact, what we did is that we had live session a little bit as we are doing today. Claire was in her studio and she was presenting the pieces and giving uh, question and answers for about half an hour. Um, and of course, we develop um, different assets, which are today super useful, and especially a movie on Claire explaining the different technical details of all the different pieces of the collection. So with all these assets and Claire being in her studio uh, in live, uh, the journalists appeared to be super happy on the way we presented the collection because they they were in contact with Claire, but they also have the opportunity to have all the details on the different pieces. Um, so I think it's a format that we may um, use again. And the second thing is that we decided that uh, depending on the market, they have to choose the way they're going to do it locally, meaning, or the journalist just connects and, and, and they're live with Claire from them home, their home, for example, or they decide um, to gather in a hotel, or for example, in Ginza in Japan, uh, in Tokyo, they were in, in the last floor of our boutique. So all the journalists came in and they had the session, especially for them. So we really adapting um, to the needs locally. For the clients, it's very different because they didn't come, but we could not do that kind of live session, but we, we developed a new selling ceremony um, in Vendôme, particularly, to present to our um, VIPs the collection, selecting some pieces that we know uh, may suit to them, and, um, and we're presenting to them through Zoom, Teams, uh, etc. So it's, it's working. We've been selling pieces uh, through this scan, but I think it's working when you know very much your clients, so you have a clear relationship, and we have the chance to be very close to our VIP clients. So when you know them very well, it's quite, it's quite easy. It has to be very organized because you're less concentrated when you're in the Zoom, like it's different from chatting having a cup of coffee where you can stay, especially in Vendôme, it's an incredible space. You don't even think you've been here for five minutes. In fact, it's been an hour. So you can stay when you're in Vendôme, but when you're in Zoom, it has to be quite quick because at some point the client, they want to see the details, but they don't want to spend two hours on a meeting via Zoom. So we have to adapt to that. Uh, and last but not least, what um, we said is that if the client and the journalist cannot come, then uh, the collection is going to be sent to them. If they cannot travel, the collection is going to travel. So for the first time, the collection uh, is moving, has left already to the south of France. Then the collection um, will go in Asia, in Taiwan, then we have a very big event in, uh, in China, in Beijing, because we're opening a new flagship boutique and the collection will be there and then to Japan. So basically, and, and the team locally are going to explain the collection, have meeting with the client, have meeting with the press. Um, the journalists will have shootings, etc. So um, we really adapt locally in these circumstances. We have to be agile, but I think it's, it's uh, all the different companies are doing the same because you have to react to that kind of exceptional situation. That's definitely a way to pivot. And I think that you've got some pieces there to show just like, um, you know, if I, you were showing Zoom yet. <laughs> I wanted to show, I'm not sure it's the right selling ceremony because we do not use exactly the same, uh, the same tool that we're using now. But I wanted to show you what is so typical, the icon of Hydrie of Boucheron. Frédéric Boucheron created the question mark necklace 
you can understand why it's a question mark because it looks like a question mark, but it's totally flexible. We are using today exactly the same technique as we used to do uh, in 1879. And the purpose of Frédéric Boucheron is that he wanted to freeze a woman because at that time, um, women needed to put on uh, her chair wells to have a lady's maid or a husband to be helped. And as he wanted the woman to be free, he decided to invent um, this object with um, no, nothing to close it. And so you can just put it on your wrist like this very mm. easily. And, uh, and, and it's very simple to wear but it's beautiful and you don't have to, you don't need anybody to help you to put it on. It's gorgeous. And the other thing that I wanted to show you, I didn't talk about the animals. We are very strong in animals at Boucheron. Uh, I think that we have the best bestiary on Place Vendôme because we have uh, many, many different animals at Boucheron. Um, one of the most famous uh, is, of course, the cat, Vladimir the cat, but we have also plenty of different ones. And they are very related to emotional. And uh, we have some clients, for example, which are collecting um, animals. And when they talk about their bouchon animal, it's, it's really a relationship which is about emotion because all our animals are cute, nice, sweet. And um, so it really depends on, on, on the animal that you, you love, but I think it's one of the uh, most incredible bestiary uh, in Place Vendôme. And I love that one. I don't know if you can see her. It's Perfect. A, she's a deer. She's a deer. Look at the eyes. She's incredible. <laughs> <It's a detail. laughs> I love her so much. She's so cute. <laughs> You're on one hand, snake on the other. <laughs> yeah. I have another animal, which is my favorite, mine. I, I bought it when I just joined Boucheron, which is uh, the serpent, the snake. Gorgeous. So I'm wearing today. And it's really uh, super nice too. Love. So um, what do you think, in your opinion, is the biggest challenge that your industry faces at the moment and how, I mean, it sounds like you're already pivoting a bit with bringing the collections to clients and to journalists, but what other ways are you thinking about pivoting? I think the most important challenge for all uh, the industry today is that the client cannot move. So until they move, um, we're going to have a big problem. You can see that the, the, the Place Vendôme is empty. Um, at that time of the year, typically in London, in Geneva, in Paris, uh, it's full of tourists, um, people browsing around, and, and, and we don't have any tourists today. So I think that um, it's going to be a difficult period and until um, we all can travel uh, again. So I think it's going to be the most um, challenging because, in fact, the consumption is booming, but it's booming locally. So, which is a good news. Uh, fortunately, uh, for example, China consumption is, in China is doing very great, um, but now the clients are buying locally. So we have to organize ourselves so that uh, we have the right pieces at, in the right place, in the right country, and all of that has to be in, organized. Um, but I think also that, that jewelry industry is one, one of the most resilient industry in the world. Uh, because we are uh, working with uh, basically gold and diamonds, so it has an investment value. You never throw away a jewel, you will give it to your daughter, she will give it to her daughter. So we're in a very long-term perspective in our industry, and there's that, that investment value which is super important. And even if, we, if you buy just for fun jewelry, which is now very common, um, you still have in the, in the part of your brain that you're investing in something that, that will stay, will uh, keep its value. And that is why during um, a crisis, uh, in general, uh, our industry is super resilient to the crisis. So we may have difficulty for a time, but I don't think, um, I hope uh, it's going to be again a proof of the resilience of our industry uh, in, the, in the months to come. And what does Paris feel like right now? Um, what is the vibe there? Are people relieved to be out, happy, scared? 
No, it's uh, quite surprising. Paris is really back to Parisians. So meaning that all the Parisians are in, in the streets. Um, they're not uh, wearing a lot of masks, which for me uh, is not good at all. But I don't know if um, you, un you understood that um, our president, Mr. Macron, asked uh, for all of the French people to wear masks in a, in a, at all time uh, as of today. So I hope that they will, it will come back and that they all will uh, wear masks like, like, like in Asia, like uh, probably in the US. So it, it will probably help. But basically I think the, the people do not look afraid. Uh, they look quite happy um, post uh, confinement and, and, and after the lockdown. Um, but it's a city which is super Parisian because you don't, we don't have any tourists in the city. So it's really uh, Paris for Parisian people, I would say. And how about you? You're used to traveling everywhere. So has it been nice rediscovering your city in this way when it's mostly just Parisians? Yes, it's quite surprising not to travel anymore. And, um, but I, I'm happy to be here. I'm super happy to be here. But at the same time, I miss a lot traveling. Um, and uh, pretty much every day I say to myself, oh, I should be in China. Or I should be there, and and um, you know on Facebook they're just um, coming with some memories of you, and each time I have memories. Oh, you were in Japan, or this week you were in China, and each time, oh yes, I've been all <laughs> in all these different <laughs> countries. But I'm, I'm in Paris. I've been in Paris in, for the last five months, um, so it's quite nice. It's new for me, and I miss a little bit traveling, of course. Has it made you rediscover things that you loved about the city, about your city? Not very much, because to be honest, I was locked down in the countryside because I'm a, a big fan of nature, like Claire Schwem. And um, as soon as the, the lockdown began, I flew away from Paris. She flew away also from Paris to her house in the countryside in Portugal. And, um, and I've been here for three months and I was so happy. Um, I was so happy to be there because uh, for, for the people who had the luck um, to be locked down in, in the nature, you didn't feel the lockdown. I mean, and, um, but all my friends that were staying in Paris said that they were discovering a Paris completely new with, with birds, with everything, but they could not go out basically, which for mm -hmm. me was not the case. So I didn't feel trapped at all. Um, so I would say that I must enjoy um, the countryside uh, since I've been in France than uh, specifically Paris. Because when I come to Paris since the reopening, it's really to work super hard and then um, fly again back to my countryside. Well, in the countryside and then getting back to work, is there anything, particularly in the countryside, since that's where you were quarantined, is there anything you learned on a personal level about yourself or on a, on a professional level as well um, that you might not have had the chance to discover otherwise? I think that the most um, important thing, I, I knew that I could live in the countryside, which for me is not natural. I've been raised in Paris. I was really a, a super... Uh, um, city girl um, and I knew that I was really attracted by nature for the last 20 years it, it becomes something super important to me super important to me because it gives me back energy so it compensates I'm always traveling flying everywhere I'm always super energetic and I need that balance to um, to, to to be safe and 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 to see also to have a clear mind um, and I discovered during uh, lockdown that uh, it's not painful to me uh, to live in the countryside, which for a typical city girl would have been, could have been surprising. But I decided to, um, to go in the countryside from the beginning because I have kids and I said I don't want them to be like lions in a cage in Paris. Uh, but in fact, it's probably myself that enjoyed it the most, <laughs> being <Sorry>. there. <laughs> And the second thing that I discovered during that crisis, again, which is not totally new to me because I'm, I already went through different crises in the, uh, I would say, economic crisis. But from the beginning, I said to my team, um, when we had, um, uh, to my ex-co-members, 
that um, you should never spoil a good crisis. And I think that the crisis is accelerating uh, trends and um, they all put us uh, out of our zone of comfort and in general it comes the best uh, from, from this kind of experience. So, and, and we were super agile, super creative during that period. I'm very proud of my team, super proud of my team on the way they've been uh, working during the lockdown, on their investment, on their agility. Um, and I think that you always have to take the positive side um, on anything. And truly, I think that we managed to take the positive side and make the most of it because it was super stressful in a way. Um, but we really needed um, uh, to take the best part, uh, the sunny part of it. And looking forward, um, what do you think, where do you think the brand is going to go given uh, the sort of limitations for the rest of the year and maybe through a little bit of next year as well? I think we have, um, uh, what will be the most difficult, for example, we're opening um, a boutique, as I was explaining, in SKP in Beijing. It's the biggest mall in China. I've been fighting for the place for three years. Um, and what is super sad is that I cannot travel and uh, even the team cannot travel. So we're opening our most important flagship in China and we all validated by Zoom. So it's a, it's a huge frustration for me not to be there and, and to really see, because I'm super involved in retail. Um, and for example, when I renovated Vendome, I was on, on, on the place pretty much every day. Uh, and at the end of the, of the work, I was here, yes, every day. So I could check everything, be sure that, that, the, that the decor was the right one, etc. And And here we cannot move. So we have um, to, I don't know them in English, lâcher prise. I mean, you have to trust the people that are doing the boutique. Uh, we try to validate a little bit with the Zoom meeting and, and we hope that it's going to be at the level of quality that I would have, uh, have, uh, have, have validated um, locally. So I think uh, this is um, the big challenge that we have today. Um, and for the rest of the year, what I said is that we, we hope that the clients will come back to Paris and that will be uh, happy to welcome them again and uh, that everything will be reopened and then and life will be better again, I would say. And what to you, in your opinion, is the greatest luxury in life? I think that time is the greatest, the greatest luxury in life. Because in fact, if you have time, you have all you want to enjoy luxury. If you have only luxury, but not the time to enjoy it, then it's useless. So I think the greatest luxury in life is, is the time. Fantastic. Um, is there anything else you'd like to share about the brand or, um, you know, what, what you're doing now? The I want you, I want you and all of your friends to, um, to come to Paris to visit flagship, uh, Place Vendôme, our new flagship that we, uh, renovated. So as soon as you can travel again, please come to us, come to see us and to visit even for a coffee. Um, my best pleasure is that, that people just jump into the boutique, um, not for buying, but just to visit and to say hello. And I think, I think one of the particularities of Boucheron is that we are really um, an open brand. I don't, want, I don't want any distance. I don't want people to be afraid to uh, to jump in the building, even if it's from the 18th century and that it's very luxurious. We did everything in Vendôme to show our, uh, to show our art de vivre and the generosity of the brand. We renovated it really um, uh, to tell to the world that um, it's a place where we want to accommodate, to, to accommodate our clients like friends, not like clients. So everything is dedicated for them to have a nice time. And I don't know if you know, we, mem we even... Uh, um, renovated an apartment on the third floor where we accommodate our VIP clients. And we had a deal with the Ritz, uh, the Ritz, uh, Ritz and Place Vendôme, the uh, hotel. And uh, they operate the suite, the apartment, when we have a VIP client. So it's really about our generosity and friendship with the client. So I really want people to come and see us here. Wonderful. Alan, thank you so much for your time thank today. Thank you very much. It. it was a pleasure talking to you.
Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Stay safe in Paris. <laughs> you too. Stay safe. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.